to do. I didn't know enough to know you weren't good at it. I, I thought you were pretty awesome in first grade. I thought you were pretty good. So, but I did get my good at first grade. We, we're pretty confident in some of the things we got right. Yeah. Uh, today is just a different day. I mean, it's just a different day. I mean, we're just going to have to keep working at it. And I think that's what we're doing. All right, how are we doing tonight, y'all? Come on, Bible study is Wednesday night. School's back, at least all kids, but Mustang, all those kids start back tomorrow, so we're in a good season, amen? Come on, isn't it good to be here? Thanks for being a part of tonight. Thanks for being at Wednesday. I want to encourage you of a couple things. One, after tonight, I want you to invite somebody else to be in the room with you. I think it's important that we know the Word of God, that we believe the Word of God, and that we get taught the Word of God. And I'm just telling you, you are in for a treat. If you are watching online, let me welcome you. We're running every Wednesday night while Dr. Fisher is here online. So I want you to share it with somebody. Comment below. You can reach out to us through the online ministry as well. We want to connect with you through the comment section so you can do that all through this talk and then share it with somebody. So if y'all miss any Wednesday nights, they will all be online. Or if you know somebody serving in Next Generation Ministries, they don't have to miss this because they can go back, watch online, and be a part of what's taking place in this room over the next several weeks. Now, I want to introduce you to Dr. Todd Fisher, who is right here. He is the Executive Director for the Oklahoma Baptist. That's just a great title to say he's in charge. Amen? Uh, incredible man of God. I got to know Dr. Fisher not too long ago as we went to D.C. together on a trip. And that's when he was pastor of Emmanuel and Shawnee, one of the, quite honestly, one of the greatest churches in the state of Oklahoma under his leadership. It, it just blew up and grew like crazy. And so he feels our pain. Amen? Like he gets it and he understands. So that's even better that he'll be with us, but he's also a history teacher and a Bible teacher and a professor at Oklahoma Baptist University, and I've heard from many teachers, no pressure, Dr. Fisher, but I've heard from a lot of students that you're a pretty good teacher. Like, I've heard it's really good, man, so we're pretty fired up to have you, and we are honored. I know you're busy. This man's taken the job over the past year, and he is wanting to get to know the entire state of Oklahoma. He's in a different church. You need to put him on your prayer list. I would encourage you to follow him on social media so you know where he's at so you can pray for him. And that we can do that as a church for him because through his leadership, uh, we could really see an explosion of a spiritual movement all through the state of Oklahoma. And we want to be a part of that. And I'll tell you right here, Dr. Fisher, we're in to serve Oklahoma Baptist in every way possible. And we're honored to do so. So we're fired up, man. We're, we're glad you're here and to be a part of tonight, I want to encourage you to invite somebody to be part of it with us. You're going to lean in. Bring your Bibles. This is a Bible study, all right? Bring a Bible with you and have a good time. If you don't have your Bible, open up your phone, turn, turn your notifications off so you don't get distracted. You can lean in, and I can't wait to see where this goes over the next several weeks. All right, let's pray together and we'll get started. Jesus, we are so grateful for this opportunity to be here. We're grateful for all those joining online. We're grateful for all those that are in the room. There's just nothing like being in the room in community. Lord, thank you for Dr. Fisher giving up time. He's busy. He's got a lot going on. You're using him in mega ways all over the state. So, Lord, we pray that you just give him a freshness being here. I pray you put people here at our church over the next few weeks just to breathe life into him, just to encourage him as he pastors us on Wednesday nights. We're so grateful for that. Would you bless us? time over the next few weeks. Let us worship you, honor you, and celebrate you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Y'all stand. Let's worship with Cody. And we got Eric Wall back in the house. It is good to have you back. He's been a summer intern somewhere down south, but we're glad you came back to the promised land. Amen. Y'all lead us.
hands ready to sing tonight. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. Blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before him. So open up, so open up the gates, make way before the king of kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh Come on, we sing. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb. the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, yes, every knee will bow before him. stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, can stop the Lord? We sing that again. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord Almighty. Yeah. Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in fighting our battles. I'll be Church, amen. Sing so, Lord, I come and I confess. Oh, Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart.
grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are is all I am free and holiness is Christ in me oh, sing what I need Lord I need you oh I need you oh, every hour I need you you're my one defense my righteousness My soul derives to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on me. And Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I uh, teach my song to rise to you, when temptation comes, temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand out for all you are Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay Sing, Jesus, you're my hope Cause Jesus, you're my hope and stay My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, oh, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, cause you're my one defense, my Oh God, how I need you. Oh God, how I need you. Thanks for worshiping with us. Um, would you guys mind taking a seat? <laughs> Take our attention to the screens. I don't know if I can beat that bumper video. That's, wow, that's pretty powerful. Uh, I think there was some mistake um, when Brian contacted me. He asked me to speak, share with you, preach tonight my exhaustive sermon on the 12 tribes of Israel. It only takes about six hours to finish. So, and then next, next Wednesday, he said he wanted me to do uh, one on the genealogies. And uh, is that what you said? No? Just, 
Actually, you can make the genealogies interesting, but uh, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. By the way, I invite you to speak at my funeral with that uh, introduction. Uh, so my name is Todd Fisher. I've been a pastor in the state of Oklahoma for the last 30 years. And as Brian mentioned, for the last 19 of that, I've been a pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Shawnee. Uh, for about the last 20 years, uh, I have been teaching for Southwestern Seminary and for Oklahoma Baptist University and for Southern Seminary, uh, all three. So pastoring and preaching and teaching, that's kind of my jam. I really love to do that. And uh, when I took this new role in January, um, it became a conflict of interest for me to be able to uh, be a professor at OBU uh, because I'm technically on their board of trustees now. So I've missed it. So uh, I was really thankful when Brian said, hey, would you come teach a deal for us? And I was like, I'm there. I'm, I'm on that. So uh, thanks for being here tonight. And uh, what Brian had asked me to do was to, was to teach you a, about the Bible. And uh, let, me, let me tell you a little bit what we're going to do over the next eight weeks. So uh, for years and years and years, I taught a class called Biblical Hermeneutics for Southwestern Seminary and for OBU. Uh, biblical Hermeneutics, by the way, is not a study of all the Hermans in the Bible, okay? As uh, one college student one asked me that on the first day of class, and I kindly said, I don't think this class is going to be for you. Um, <clears throat> there are no Hermans uh, in the Bible, but no, hermeneutics is a fancy word for how to interpret the Bible. And what we do in hermeneutics is we kind of take about the first half of that class, and before we ever really get into the details of how do we interpret the Bible, uh, what we want to do in that class is we want to establish very solidly that the Bible is a trustworthy book for us to interpret. So we really need to, to dive in and we really need to understand, uh, is this book in my hand actually the product of the mind of God? Uh, does it really come from God? Is it really worth me reading? Is it really worth me studying? Is it really worth me basing my life on? Is it really worth me determining, des deciding in my life what is true, what is false, what is moral, what is immoral? Is this a trustworthy document? Because let, let's face it, we live in a culture today that increasingly uh, does not believe in God or church or this book as the product of my, it does not believe that this book is God's truth, that it's absolute truth. It just doesn't believe that. Um, it's, 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 it's a myth, it's a fairy tale, it's a, all an allegory. It was made up by, you know, the Gospels were just written by four dudes at the Jerusalem Starbucks who just decided one day at the coffee shop they'd invent a religion. So we're going to talk about all that. So what I want to do in the next eight weeks is I want to basically give you kind of a crash course of the first half of a seminary level hermeneutics class, okay? But we're not going to make it really fancy and way up here and use a bunch of, uh, we're just going to, you know, we're going to make this where we can understand it. And, and my goal is, uh, is to teach you in these eight weeks, what, what, is, what is the nature of the Bible, right? Can I trust it? What is, what is its nature? And then if all of that goes well, maybe Brian will have me back and I'll teach the second half of hermeneutics to you. And uh, the second half of hermeneutics is, is, is all the interpretive rules that we use with the different genres of scripture of how we actually interpret a biblical text. So what we're gonna do though in these next eight weeks is we're gonna talk about the Bible, how do I know it's from God, how do I know it's trustworthy. We'll talk about its historical formation, uh, we'll get into that, you know, is this all just a bunch of made up stuff? And uh, I'll just tell you at the outset, uh, no other book in human history has been scrutinized like the Bible. And yet the Bible stands up to every test. All right, here to either if I get to it tonight or tomorrow, you know, one of the things I'm going to teach you is we, we have never dug anything out of the sand that disproves the Bible. I mean, not, not, not one relic of artifact of archaeology has ever disproved the Bible. In fact, everything we've ever dug up out of the sand just actually proves that the Bible is tr telling you the truth. It's amazing. So let, let's just kind of start. I, I want to kind of get us down this track of, of why we need the Bible by telling you a little story here. Okay? So a little story goes like this. Uh, there was a company that was kind of struggling, and they got a new kind of young, fiery CEO. And the new, young, fiery CEO, he, uh, he kind of goes out there on the floor where most of the leadership team is, and he decides he's going to shake some things up. He's going to decide 
that he's going to teach these employees that he really means business. And so he goes out there and he decides he's going to pick one of them out to kind of make an example of him. And he, when he walks out there, he sees one guy just kind of leaning up against the wall doing nothing. And he says, that's the guy. And so he calls the guy over and says, hey, you, come here. Now, everybody, we're going to do things differently around here. We're going to shake it up and fire it up. And he says, you, he says, how much money do you make a week? And the guy says, like, $300. And the CEO pulls out $1,200 in cash out of his pocket. Now, you know, CEOs have that much cash in their pocket, right? And he pulls out $1,200 in cash, and he gives it to the guy. says, here, here's a month pay. You're fired. Now get out of here. And the guy just kind of takes the $1,200, puts it in his pocket, and leaves. And he looks at the rest of the employees and says, now, somebody tell me what that no good for nothing guy does around here anyway. And one of the employees said, that was the Domino's pizza delivery guy. <laughs> now you say, well, what does that story have to do with anything about the Bible? Okay, listen to this. Ready? Listen. We live in a culture that is searching for the truth. We want to know what is the truth. And by the way, if, if you think about it and frame it in a little more of a philosophical kind of, kind of aspect, we want to know the truth about life's biggest questions. What are life's biggest questions? Life's biggest questions are these. How did I get here? Was I created by some higher intelligence? Was, did I just evolve by random chance? How did I get here? That's the first question. The second question is, what do I do now that I'm here? What is the purpose for living? And the third question is, What's going to happen to me when I die? Now, I think you'd be, you'd be lying to me if you looked at me and said, I've never thought of any of those questions. No, I think we've all thought about those questions. In fact, most of us probably think about those questions just about every day, don't we? And I'm going to stand here and tell you that the only satisfactory answers to those questions is in this book right here. And so here's the thing, we want to know these big questions. By the way, I, I'll tell you one even more. This is an amazing little stat, listen to this, listen to this. Did you know that since the year 2010, so in the last 12 years, there have been 10,000 books written and published with the word identity in the title? Now look at me, I'm going to tell you something. This nation, this culture is in an identity crisis. We want to know who are we? What is the truth? Now back to my little story about the CEO and the Domino's pizza delivery guy. The whole point of that is the CEO's sinfulness, right? His, his brashness, his, his emotion, it got in the way of knowing the truth didn't it? And that's kind of what we do. I mean, we let every, every wind of culture, we let every little bit of fickleness about us. I mean, you know, we, we can't even decide in our society what really is true or not. I mean, it, you, know, you know what I'm saying? You know, one week they tell you, don't go in the sun, it's bad for you. And then the next week they tell you, oh, you need to go in the sun, it's got vitamin D. Right? One week they say, you know, don't eat Twinkies. I guess they never say do eat Twinkies. I mean, I, I, I say that. But have you ever noticed how we're, we just vacillate? And so listen when I say this to you. As sinful human beings, we really can't be trusted to know what the truth is. We need someone beyond ourselves who is perfect, who created us to tell us what is true. Now, I want to tell you something. If you're writing down any notes, I want you to write this one down. You ready? Now, you listen to this. Write this down. Here we come. Listen to me. I, I, I say this. Anytime I get to speak to younger people, I say this to them. Listen. Truth is not something you make. Truth is something you find. 
We live in a culture that says, oh, you, you, you make the truth. You create the truth. What is truth? Well, truth is whatever you want it to be. If it feels good, if you like it, if you want to do that, then, then truth can be whatever it is. And listen, friends, we all know where that path ends when we start believing that truth is something we make. It's not anything we make. Truth is something we find, and we find the truth right here in this book in the Bible. All right, so let's, let's just kind of dive in for a second then. Uh, what is the Bible? You, you got this book in your lab. You got this thing on your screen. Um, what is the Bible? Well, uh, first of all, let me show you this picture right here. Uh, this is the city of Byblos, okay? Um, Byblos is in modern-day Lebanon, and uh, this is where the, the name Bible actually comes from and so it goes to a greek word and then it's a latin word and i could i could teach you all that but it was it's very boring i get boring talk, get bored talking about it but biblos back in ancient times was a city it's a phoenician city then that was known for its 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 import and export of papyrus and papyrus is what you you would it was the books you would you would write it that's what you would write on and so this, this whole idea of biblos, biblios, kind of became synonymous with the book. So if you kind of work all the semantics in it, the Bible actually means the book. So that, that, that's, that's kind of a little bit of the etymology of the name of it. Now, let me tell you these two things about the Bible. First of all, the Bible is a book about God, okay? It's written by God through men to glorify himself. It is the revelation of himself to us. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is, the Bible is a book about me. Now, the Bible tells me what God wants us to know about him, right? It, it tells us about all of his attributes, all of his omnis, everything about him. But the Bible doesn't tell us everything about God. But the Bible is sufficient in that it tells us what God wants us to know about him. But then the Bible also tells us about us. And what does the Bible say about us? Uh, the Bible says that we were created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. What does that mean? Uh, the image of God is that aspect of you where you are self-aware. It sets you apart from the plants. It sets you apart from the animals. Uh, you have the soul. You have this conscience. You are self-aware. You are made in the image of God. You were made perfectly by God, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And then in Genesis 3, humanity messes all of it up and sins. By the way, if you think about it in, 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 in academics, we call the Bible a meta-narrative. And what is a meta-narrative? Meta, big. And so the Bible is really just one big, long story. And the big long story, people, uh, I get asked this from time to time, and some people, sometimes people try to trick me, and they ask me this question. They say, hey, uh, pastor, can you narrow the Bible down to one word? And I always say, easy. That one word is redemption. Because the Bible is a story of how God perfectly created the world and the universe, and then he created huma humanity, they were perfect. Adam and Eve took walks with God in the garden, right, uh, in the cool of the day. They had this perfect relationship with God in the garden, and then they sinned, and when they sinned in Genesis 3, all of that was destroyed. And from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, the Bible is one big long story of how God redeems what we destroyed, and he does it through the work of Jesus Christ, his son. By the way, I, 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 now y'all going to find I'm very passionate about the Bible. I love to study the Bible. The Bible, when you just dig in, dive into the Bible, you find so many incredible nuggets like this. And, and, and just to kind of show you, teach you a little bit of how the, the, you, you see Jesus and the theme of redemption all through all the pages of the Bible. You know, there's one little interesting thing in Luke's narrative of, of the crucifixion. And in Luke's narrative of the crucifixion, here's Jesus, he's, he's, he's hanging on the cross, he's, he's a criminal on each side of him. And both of the criminals at the beginning, they, they, they begin to hurl insults, insults at Jesus, just like all the crowds hurling insults at Jesus. But somewhere in the, in the line, about halfway through or so, one of the criminals changes his, changes his heart. 
And he realizes, wait a minute, this really, this guy really is who he says he is. He really is the son of God. And remember what he says to Jesus? He says, Jesus, you don't deserve to hang here. You are the sinless, perfect, you're the son of God. I do deserve to hang here. And he confesses his sin, right? And then he says to Jesus, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. So there's all of the components of salvation right there. Right? Hey, Jesus, you are God. I am a sinful hum human, and, and I have my sin, and I need you to forgive me, and, and, and I want to follow you. You are the king. And you remember what Jesus says to him? <laughs> Luke causes us all kinds of trouble. There's a perfectly good Greek word for heaven, very common, but Jesus doesn't use it right there. Do you all remember? He says, he looks at the thief, and he says, today you will be with me in, you got it, paradise. Now, that's fascinating. Uh, it, it's, it's what we call a hapax legomena. I told you I wasn't going to use big words. Hapax legomena is a Latin phrase to say only once. It's the only time in the whole Bible that word is used. And what's fascinating about that word paradise is it's not a Greek word. It's not a Hebrew word. It's not an Aramaic word. It's a Persian word. It's a Persian loan word used in Aramaic speaking in the, in the first century. Like, like uh, if, we, if we used a foreign word and, and it's kind of synonymous, like, you know, if, if you drive a Volkswagen, everybody knows Farfignugan, right? That, that, that would be like, maybe that was a bad example based on your lack of laughter. <clears throat> I'm old. <laughs> Are you ready for this? Listen to me. You know what the word paradise means in Persian? It means the garden. Today, you will be with me in the garden. And why would Jesus say that? Because he looks at the thief and he says, you know what? Here's what's going to happen. Because of your faith in me, your confession of sin, your belief in me, here's what's going to happen. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning how it was supposed to be when man and woman were in the garden in a perfect utopia, in a perfect relationship with God. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. This is how it's supposed to be. Friends, that's, that's the Bible. And so when we say a Bible is a book about God and the Bible is a book about me, it's what it's talking about, who he is and my need for him. Now, there's one more thing I want to share with you about the Bible before I, I kind of just get into a little bit of an outline with you here. Um, it's this, and is that the Bible is something that is what we would call propositional truth. Um, it is factual, it is absolute, right? The, the, the Bible is true in all times, in all places. The Bible is never not true in any kind. Of, it, it's true in every culture, it's true in every area of period. It, it's true, it's absolute. It's factual, okay? So listen. You need to know that, the, that God did not give us the Bible to just be a truckload of facts. Now, the Bible is full of facts. Everything in the Bible is true. It is, it is factual. But God did not give us the Bible just to be a truckload of facts, right? Listen to me say this. If you want to write this one down, you can write this one down. God did not give us the Bible just to inform us, but also to transform us. So when God gives us all this truth in the Bible, it's not for me to just read and study and then walk out of the room and just go live however I was living beforehand and say, well, that was nice or that was factual. No, when God gives us the Bible, he's giving us truth that he wants us to obey. He wants it to change our lives. That's what the word propositional means. Propositional truth means this truth is making a proposition to you. Are you going to do this? Are you going to obey this? Now, let's think of it. I apologize in advance. If you look at this picture that's coming up right here, and it gives you the creeps, but here it is, okay? Now, let's just play the facts proposition game, okay? Uh, this, is, this is a picture of an anaconda, now, here's a fact. You ready? Fact. The anaconda can grow to a length of 30 feet. Fact. Big snake. Biggest snake in the world. 
The anaconda can grow to a, a length of 30 feet, in fact. Here comes the proposition. You ready? Uh, there is an anaconda under your chair. <laughs> Do you all hear the difference? When I say to you an anaconda can grow to 30 feet long, you all just sit there and you go, wow, that's, that's big. That's, that's, that's great. What are we having for dinner after this? When is he going to stop talking? <laughs> but when I say there's an anaconda under your chair, I'm going to see some people move faster than they've ever moved in their whole life. One is just a factual statement. The other one is a call to action, isn't it? Now, uh, James kind of gets at this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we'll just put it in some vernacular here. Let's just say, let's say you're out at an important, you know, business lunch or something like that. And you, you excuse yourself, you go to the restroom. And uh, while you're washing your hands in the bathroom, you kind of, you know, it's, a, it's an important business lunch. You're kind of looking yourself over a little bit. And you notice that you've got something big and green in your teeth. Okay? Now, who in here at an important business lunch, for that matter, at any time, who of us in here is going to notice something big and green in our teeth and just go, huh, i got something big and green in my teeth. And then I go right back to the table. Nobody going to do that. What are you going to do? If you see something big and green in your teeth, what are you going to do? You're going to do this right here. You're going to start getting that thing out of there, aren't you? You see this fact. I have something green in my teeth. It calls for action. What did James say, right? Hey, if all we do is just hear the word, but don't do the word, we're really missing what it's all about. So I want to give you this, 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 this picture right here, and um, it's got four words on it, authoritative, authentic, accurate, and accessible ethical, okay? So tonight and next Wednesday night, we're going to, uh, we're going to try to cover these four things. Now, I'm going to try to make the first two, okay? And that's preacher talk for, I only really make the first one. Okay, that's, that's, that's probably what it is. Um, but here, 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 when we talk about the nature of the Bible, right, the, the construct of it, the, is it really true, all that kind of thing. Um, here, here's something I like to teach my students. It is authoritative. It is authentic. Historically, we can trust this. It is accurate. There, there's, no, there's nothing false in it. There's, nothing, and there's no error in it. And then it is an accessible and applicable book for us. It's amazing that something that comes from the mind of God who created the universe with, boom, a spoken word is going to give us something that we can understand. Now, there's parts of the Bible that are very difficult to understand, but let's face it. That's one of the beauties of the Bible. The Bible is such a deep book, it can stump the greatest scholar, but it can be such a simple book that even a child understands the plan of salvation, right? So let's, let's just start with this. And so let's begin by talking about, is the Bible authoritative? So if you want to take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want us to look at verses 16 and 17, and I have it on the screen for you here as well, but if you'd like to look in, in your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And so one of the things that we do in a hermeneutics class is we talk about, okay, if the Bible is authoritative, let's talk about it in terms of what we call internal evidence. And internal evidence means what does the Bible say about itself, okay? If, if even the Bible didn't say it was really the mind of God and it was really all completely true, if the Bible didn't say that, then we would kind of struggle with that. But the Bible does say that. So when we look at the Bible itself, what does the Bible say? Okay, so here's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, just, let's just focus on this text on the, on, on the screen for a second. All scripture is inspired. Inspired is a Greek word. It means theo, God, neustos. Uh, we, we get the English word like pneumatic, something with air from it. 
It literally means God breathed. In fact, if we really do a deep dive on the morphology of the word, it, it, it actually means God has, has expiated. He has breathed out the text. And you notice, what is the very first word of this verse of the scripture? Is it some? Is it most? It is all scripture is inspired by God. So it is breathed out by God. It is the product of the mind of God. Now look at the second text right here from 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, 21 affirms the same thing. Peter says, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So this Bible is not the product of just humanity. And what I'm going to teach you in a minute, how the Bible is inspired, God used humans. God used their background. He used their education. He used their personality. God used humans, but at the end of the day, the Bible comes from God. And next week when we talk about inerrancy, things like that, can I really trust the Bible? Uh, uh, yeah. If the Bible came from God and God is perfect, what does it say about this book? Now, another bit of internal evidence is what Jesus had to say. So look on the screen again at Matthew 5, 17. So Jesus is speaking about the Old Testament, which was the Bible of the time, the scripture they had. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. A law or prophets is, is, is a placeholder for all of the Old Testament. He says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And so Jesus believed that, hey, there's, not, there's, there, there, there's nothing uh, uh, full of errors in here. There, there's nothing lacking authority in here. And G, even Jesus himself, right? So if, if, this, if this Bible, if this book was the product of man's mind and it was full of mistakes, what would Jesus have said? Jesus would have said, hey, I came and I'm going to clean up that mess that's the Old Testament. Because there's all kinds of mistakes in Isaiah, and there's all kinds of mistakes in Jeremiah, and oh my, don't even get me started on Leviticus, and there's all kinds of problems in there. Jesus, Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, I didn't come to fix any of this. You know why? Because it doesn't need to be fixed. I came to fulfill it. So when Jesus, this is what Jesus thought about the Bible. Um, it says a lot to us then. If he said it, and maybe I'm just an old kind of, <laughs> I, I can be a good old redneck, hillbilly, bumpkin, kind of whatever. You know, maybe I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but here's the thing. If Jesus says something, I'm going to go ahead and say it's true. Uh, by the way, you know, the, the, the first five books of the Bible are under all kinds of scrutiny, all right? <laughs> I mean, and then officially the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So many people say, oh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis isn't historical. It's all an allegory. Adam and Eve weren't real people. But by the way, if Adam and Eve weren't real people, how does sin come into the world and how does the gospel really work? That's a whole nother Wednesday night series. But, um, you know, and so people, people and I, I, get, I, get, I, get, I get challenged on this quite a bit, right? Because people know my stand on this and say, how can you believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible? Uh, man, another little fun, let's chase a rabbit hole for a second. Um, you know, when you read Genesis 1 and you read Genesis 2, there's two accounts of creation. When you read Genesis 1, here's an account of creation. Genesis 2, there's another account of creation. Well, why, why does Genesis tell us about creation twice? So in the 19th century in Germany, very, very liberal, very critical scholars who, who, who doubted the existence of God, they didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God who did all these miracles, and they certainly didn't believe that the Bible was the Word of God, they, they kind of came up with this theory, and they said, Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible. In fact, Moses didn't even write all of Genesis. In fact, Moses may not have wrote any, written any of Genesis, and here's the reason why. If Moses had written Genesis, why does he repeat himself? If it's a singular author, why would he say the same story twice? Well, their explanation is because he wasn't a singular author. 
This dude over here at this point in time wrote Genesis 1, and this dude over here at this point in time wrote Genesis 2, and what happened was somebody over the course of time just got all the post-it notes together and collaborated them, and there you go, there's Genesis. And the cream of the crop to them was, listen to this, every reference to God in Genesis 1 is Elohim. But in Genesis 2, Every reference to God is Yahweh. And so these liberal scholars said, well, there you go. If you actually believe that this is really the word of God and you believe Moses wrote this and all that, how can you be so foolish? It's clear that one man wrote down his version of creation and he liked to use the term Elohim and a completely different man at a different place at a different time, he, he, liked, to, his, he liked to use the word Yahweh. And so the... the and by the way, friends, if you can debunk Genesis, you can debunk the whole thing. Liberal scholars, critical scholars know what they're doing when they go after Genesis because you hit the foundation of all of it. How about a little alternate theory? By the way, <laughs> I'm an old fuddy-duddy sometimes. And I believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. You know why I think that? Because when I read the Gospels, Jesus thought that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So excuse me, I'm just going to go on out and say, Jesus is right. You want, another, you want another theory of that? Go back and read Genesis 1 and 2 again. Genesis 1 is the creation of the universe. Genesis 1 is the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars and the galaxies. It is universal. It is cosmic. By the way, Elohim is God's all-powerful cosmic, if I could say it. Elohim is God's business suit and tie name. But when you read Genesis 2, go check it. Genesis 2, that account of creation never leaves the Garden of Eden. God doesn't create the sun and the moon and the stars and all that in Genesis 2. No, it's all very local. And Genesis 2 really focuses on God's relationship with Adam and Eve. Would it then make sense that when Moses is describing the cosmic creation of the universe. He uses God's cosmic name. But when he's describing the creation of humanity in the Garden of Eden, he uses God's business casual name, Yahweh. His relational name. I don't know about y'all, but that sends a little chill up my spine. Come on. By the way, y'all want, want another little... Here's a little here, Y'all didn't pay anything to get in here, right? So here's a little free of charge. <laughs> you, like, you like to keep score of this stuff? This is why I love to study the Bible. Oh, man. Watch this. Genesis 2, I said, every reference to God is Yahweh except one. And it goes from Genesis 2 to 4, by the way. So Genesis 1, all Elohim. Genesis 2, 3, and 4, all Yahweh except one in Genesis 3. There is one usage of the name Elohim. In Genesis 2 to 4, guess where it is? Oh, this is so good. It's when Satan slithers up next to Eve and begins to lie to Eve about who God is. Oh, he's lying to you. He doesn't want you to eat that fruit because if you eat that fruit, you'll be just like him. And when Satan is lying about God to Eve, it's almost as if Moses says, you know, right here, I'm going to correct Satan, and I'm going to go back to God's cosmic, super powerful name. By the way, a little application of that, listen to me. You better make good and sure that the God you are following is the God described in this Bible. Because there's lots of folks out there that want to make God whoever they want him to be that satisfies their sinful pleasures and desires. It don't work that way, folks. So, the Bible then is inspired. It is breathed out. So let's, let, let's look at this. Um, go to this next slide for me if you would. 
Now, before we leave, and, and, and as I said, I'm only going to get to the authoritative part. We're not going to get any further, so because, I don't know, preachers, they chase too many rabbits. But let's, let's, talk, let's talk, before we leave tonight, let's talk about theories of inspiration, okay? So I would get a lot deeper with this in my seminary class, but I, I want to just touch the top of it with you. Now, exactly how did God breathe out the Bible? How exactly does the Bible come to be written on these pages from the mind of God to being written down on a page? What does that process look like? How did God inspire it? All right, so here are some theories of inspiration that I would argue is not how the Bible is inspired. Some people think the Bible is inspired this way. I'm going to tell you I don't think it's so. Here's the first one. The first theory is what's called illumination. Now, illumination is essentially, and this is a very, very simplistic definition, but illumination basically says that when you read the Bible, it's not the author, it's not the words that are inspired, you're inspired. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is, <laughs> I'm fallible. I'm sinful. Uh, I, 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 don't, I can't be trusted to really know what, what this truth is. And so that's the problem. Uh, now, can, can I feel inspired when I read the Bible? Sure. But what determines the Bible is true is not anything about me. What determines the Bible is true is that God has given these words on the page. They don't come from me. They come from God. And again, if I can just kind of get a little hellfire and preachery with you for a second, I'm going to tell you right now. We don't tell this book what is true. It tells us what is true. We don't put meaning into this book. It puts the meaning into us. And by the way, if, if ultimately it comes down to us, it's just going to break down. I, I, I'm, I, might, I, might, I might hit it right the first seven times, but man, I got feet of clay. I'm a sinner. And eventually it's going to break down. right? If, if at the end of the day you're just relying on you, it's going to break down. I love that old story about Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Y'all know Muhammad Ali? He was the epitome of self-confidence, right? Muhammad Ali, you know, uh, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But what was Muhammad Ali's little mantra? I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And I love that little probably anecdotal story, but it, it's, it's a preacher's story. I don't know if it happened or not, but it's true. Um, <clears throat> Y'all will get that later when you're going to bed tonight. Oh, I can't. that was funny. I get it. Um, <laughs> He, he's on the airplane, and uh, the stewardess walks by and says, uh, Mr. Ali, you need to put on your seatbelt. And he looked at her, and he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she looked at him and very kindly said, Superman don't need no airplane. Now put on your seatbelt. <laughs> at the end of the day, if it's all about you, it's going to break down. So it, it's, it's not illumination. Here's another one it's not. It's not dictation. Dictation is the belief that how we got the Bible is that God just zapped the author and they became like robots, like automatons. And they zip, dee, 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 dee. Um, By the way, Mor Mormons believe that the Book of Mormon is inspired this way. Muslims believe that the Koran is inspired this way. Now, why would we not believe this about the Bible? Because when we read the Bible... The personality, the background, the education of the author is just present. It's just there. And, and we can't ignore that. People ask me all the time, um, I may have a slide about this later, so if I repeat myself, forgive me. But people ask me all the time uh, when I was pastor, hey, hey, Brother Todd, did God write Romans or did Paul? And I always answered, Yes. Now, we got a few more minutes. Let me play a little fun, some fun things with you. How is it that God uses the personalities or the author? Okay, so it's hard for us sometimes to gauge this because if we can't read Greek, we're all reading those in English, it's hard to gauge this. But we can still pick this up, you know. Um, <clears throat> remember the story of the woman with the blood disorder? Remember that story? Mark tells that story, Luke tells that story. It's interesting, Mark says that the woman spent all of her money on doctors. 
Luke strangely omits that fact. And if you don't get the joke, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. But you really get this when you, if you can read the original language, you really get this. Okay. When I, when I was, eons ago, like lifetimes ago, when I was a college student, seminary student, um, my Greek teacher, if my Greek teacher walked in the room and my Greek teacher said, all right, students, today we're going we're gonna to translate something from John, we would all go, yes. Because John is this kind of simplistic elementary greek okay. john is like uh you know see jesus eat bread watch jesus walk that's john <laughs> but if the greek professor walked in the room and said all right class today we're gonna we're gonna translate something from luke we would go <laughs> luke was an educated man a trained physician and the best the best way i know how to put it is like this okay <laughs> um john very simple luke very complex okay Y'all know the story, row, row your boat. Okay. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. That's John. Here comes Luke. Luke would be propel, propel, propel your craft placidly down the solution. Exuberance, 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 exuberance. Existence is but an illusion. That's Luke. <laughs> and you, 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 just can't, you just can't get around it. You just can't help it. Matthew. Matthew writing to proud, spiritually proud Jews. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you think that you are going to be right with God because of your, your heritage, your lineage, your pride and that, boy, you are mistaken. The ones that are blessed by God are humble and understand it's nothing about them that makes them right with God. It is just God. But Luke writing to Gentiles, writing to the down and out, to the outcast, to the oppressed of society. In the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus just says, blessed are the poor. Here's a man writing to Jews, here's a man writing to Gentiles, and you see the purpose come through. So I don't think it was dictation. Here's one more that it's not. It's not dynamic. Dynamic, then, you take illumination and kind of flip it a little bit, okay? In illumination, the reader is inspired. In dynamic, the overall thought and theme is what's inspired. You know, the general idea of the Bible is inspired, but, but I mean, for goodness sakes, we're not going to trust any scientific or any historical detail of the Bible. The problem with the dynamic is this. Dynamic says some parts of the Bible are inspired, but some parts aren't. The problem is, how do you know which ones? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say, oh yeah, hey, by the way, we may have made a mistake on the names of the towns or the years or the number of people involved in the battle, so don't trust that part. But the spiritual part, y'all really need to trust that. What did, go back to 2 Timothy 3. Are parts of the Bible inspired? Is some of it inspired? All of the scripture is inspired by God. So what I would argue is that the Bible is inspired by what we call the verbal plenary uh, theory of inspiration. Verbal plen plenary means uh, from plerusa, it means full, it means all. Verbal means the words. So what we believe is that all of the words of the Bible are inspired. And God, I have time to get into this. Listen, friends, you're not, gonna, you're not going to fully, fully, fully understand what, what has come from God because it's come from God. Why would I expect my four-pound brain to perfectly explain everything about God? Can, can, I just, can I just give you all a little something here? Listen to this. You ready? I'm going to tell you. If my four-pound brain could perfectly explain everything about God, I don't think he's a very big God. And you can take this home with you. The fact that you can't explain everything about God 
should not discourage you from believing in God. It should just encourage you to believe in his greatness. And you know, you take something as great as salvation. We have brothers and sisters that, that some are, are, are believe a more reformed soteriology and, and some believe a not so reformed soteriology. You know what? There are little fine details in the deep theology of that. I don't think we're ever really going to understand. But you know what we do have to understand and believe is that Jesus Christ came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived the sinless life. He voluntarily gave his life on the cross as a substitute, as a payment for our sin. And three days later, he bodily rose from the dead. And the only way that I'm going to be saved is not by believing in anything about me or anything that I have done that would ever earn my salvation. The only way that I'm going to be saved is in my faith in who Jesus is and what he has done for me. Now, I can understand that. And it ought to actually comfort me to think that there are parts of soteriology I don't quite understand. For all I know, right, here's a middle aisle. For all I know when it comes to eschatology, that you, I, for all I know, y'all have divided yourselves, and these are all the dispensationalists, and these are all the historic premillennialists. <laughs> and right up there, that one guy by himself is the amillennialist, way up there. <laughs> I'm, I'm just teasing, sort of. Okay, um, <clears throat> no. now that'd be the postmillennial up there. Yeah, hey, you, we're going to have a difference of opinion on that. But what we got to believe and know is that one day, Jesus Christ is going to physically return to this earth, and he's going to consummate his kingdom, and he's going to make all things new. And so, let me, let me just say this one last thing, and we'll stop, because then we'll be set up for, for next week. We can get into the next day, and, and, and uh, next Sunday, next Wednesday, um, well, it'll be really interesting. We're going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to talk about the historical reliability of it. it, it if you're a nerd on that stuff, you're going to nerd out. But one more, the, the external evidence, okay? So that's all, that's all internal evidence. What does the Bible say about itself? External evidence. When I look outside of the Bible, why, why, why would I want to believe that it's God's word? So look at this little list of things um, that I've put here on external evidence. You know, you think about our own culture and our own country, how it's shaped and crafted by the Bible. Our judicial system, our culture, our traditions... Our benevolent practices. By the way, who started hospitals? Christians, churches. Who started nursing homes? Who started orphanages? It wasn't non-Christians. Education, economics, and business, all of these things that we enjoy in our country are deeply influenced by the Word of God. And not the least of which, how many of you have ever opened this book and read a passage of Scripture and it changed your life? I think we all have a testimony to that. So we'll stop there tonight. The Bible, it's authoritative. I, I can believe it. It is, an, it, it, it is deserving to be an authority over my life. Let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for our time together tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that we can trust your word, that it is authoritative. Father, how, how I pray that you would give us a deeper appreciation and a deeper passion for your word. But, but Father, just as we've said tonight, not just, not just to learn about your word or, or not just to learn the, 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 the facts or to memorize the verses, God, but Father, that we would submit ourselves to you is our authority, to the authority of the Bible over us. And Father, that we would do more than just hear the word and memorize the word and appreciate the word, but Father, that we would live out and obey the word. I pray that for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. I can just say, wow. I mean, when you start talking about the Word of God, 
And it just shows how important this is and important this is to our church. And you think about this, you may or may not know this, you know that your, your children here at our church on Sunday mornings, you're in preschool all the way through to our students. And then even in our parent Bible study, we go through the gospel project, which for if a, if a, a kid goes through our church for three years, we'll go through the entire Bible chronologically. Um, and uh, in everything we do and everything that, that anyone ever steps up on this stage to preach is preaching from the truth of the word of God. Every song that Cody and the worship team does up here all comes from the truth that comes from the word of God. As we can find authority, we can find truth through, uh, through the word. So, Dr. Fisher, thank you so much. I'm so excited that he's not just here tonight, but for seven more weeks um, with us. It's going to be incredible. Also, for these nights, we've intentionally made time um, each week, we're going to do some worships, we're going to meet some things happening, and we're also going to always be done about by 745 so that we can just have community together and have some fellowship time. Our, I want you to know this, our, your, your preschool and your kids and your students, they still go right up until 8, 8 o'clock, so don't like go try to drag them out, that kind of thing. Let them do the things they're doing and everything that's been prepared for them as well. I would also like you to do that, do this, and we're actually going to take a moment, I'm going to give you a moment on your own, and then I'd like to pray, and then I'll have one final thing, is we have possibly the biggest Wednesday night we've had in our students. Um, they're doing this incredible, just huge thing happening. The gospel is being shared to many students who haven't been in church maybe ever or haven't been in a long time. Students are bringing friends, and it is full. And our pastor sent a deal out to us, say, be praying, because Baron is sharing the gospel right now. So I'm going to give you, could you just take some moment in your seat for about a minute to just pray and pray that the gospel is clear and pray that students would respond. I'll finish this in prayer and I'll have one last announcement before we go. Would you pray for those students? God, we are so grateful. Lord, we're grateful for your word. Lord, we're grateful for your salvation, God. We're grateful that we can stand on the authority of your word, God. Lord, we pray right now as the gospel is being shared, as, as our little ones are being taught and our kids and, 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 and for so many that are, that are serving them tonight, Lord, I pray a blessing over them. And Lord, I pray for our students at this moment. As the gospel is being shared, Lord, may through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, would you draw many teenagers to you tonight. May tonight be their day. May this be their day that you save them, God, and may you do that in a big way. Lord, we thank you. We're so grateful for what you're doing in our church, what you're doing through Trinity. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our community. Lord, thank you for what you're doing through the state, God, through through the leadership of Dr. Fisher, God, thank you for him just being willing to be with us. He's all over the state, but thank you for his willingness to be with us every week over the next few weeks, God. And I pray for each person in this room that, Lord, maybe we have an even deeper understanding, a greater um, just depth, and uh, just that, 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 Lord, we look and we treasure your word, God. Lord, we're so grateful. Your word just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So, God, we tell you that we love you, and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen, amen. Well, um, again, what a great night. This is amazing. Hey, would you make sure you invite someone to come and be here next Wednesday night? Of course, we live stream. We want you to thank you. If you've been online with us tonight, you can share that for people who can't be here. Um, but invite someone, but also invite someone this Sunday. We had the biggest Sunday in the history of our church outside of Easter um, we had four people saved on Sunday. We're going to see some of those baptized this Sunday. Let's not just make it last Sunday a big day. Let's make this Sunday a big day. Invite a friend, a family member. Um, every time you go through a drive through every restaurant you're in, would you invite someone to come and be a part of Trinity so that they can hear the gospel and they can be free and they can find salvation as well. So you guys have a great night. We're so glad that you've been here. We'll see you all on Sunday.